Now I have an announcement to make. We have one more speaker who could not come because of uh, scheduling issues. Uh, he is uh, uh, the director of the uh, Earth Institute uh, of Columbia University and the director of the uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network. It's Dr. Jeffrey Sachs. He's going to join us live from New York and give us a message. Dr. Sachs is the world-renowned expert on economic uh, development and poverty issues. He serves as the advisor to the UN Secretary uh, General uh, on the MDGs, and he proposes economic uh, strategies to national and the state government. So uh, he is the most influential thinker in the uh, field of sustainable development. Please give us a minute uh, as we prepare the stage for this uh, special video session by Dr. Sachs. Thank you for waiting. Director Sachs, please give us your message. Dr. Sachs, the floor is yours. Uh, everybody, uh, can I uh, make sure that you can hear me okay? <laughs> yes. Yes, we hear you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be joining this international forum on sustainable Asia and the Pacific. And it's indeed a very timely forum, as you know. At the United Nations just a couple of days ago, the working group that has been deliberating on the sustainable development goals for the post 2015 period has just issued its report uh, with the 17 high-level goals uh, that it recommends for the post-2015 development agenda. In addition, we are now preparing for uh, the new conference on international finance for development, which will take place in the middle of next year, the dates have been set for July 12 to 15 in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And the third major item on the global development agenda, of course, is the uh, progress towards negotiating a climate agreement, which is uh, scheduled to be uh, agreed in Paris in December 2015 at the COP21. So I like to think of our period right now as uh, a very complicated three-part negotiation between now and the end of 2015 to set new sustainable development goals, to agree on a financial package uh, for development assistance, for climate financing, and for proper regulation of international financial flows. And finally, to agree on a new climate uh, framework that we hope will uh, absolutely enable uh, the world to change direction on uh, human-induced climate change. It's, of course, an absolutely enormous agenda, uh, and it entails fighting poverty, promoting social inclusion, managing uh, aging uh, in the high-income societies, managing uh, the demographic transition to low fertility in the poor countries, and at the same time as all of this fostering both economic growth and environmental sustainability. It's a rare opportunity for the world, given the confluence of all of these uh, development agendas in the same time, in the same year, 
finance, sustainable development, and climate change. So we have to make very good use of it. And for that, we're going to need active participation of every country in the world. Uh, and I'm very happy in counting on Japan's major participation in the critical negotiations in the next 18 months. Pr please permit me to say a few words about one of these three main subjects, though they're all interconnected. I want to talk about the climate change agenda. And I also want to draw your attention to a recent report that I and others have put out uh, that I'm uh, holding up to the camera now called Deep Decarbonization. This is a report that was issued last week to UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and to French Foreign Minister Ola, uh, French Foreign Minister Fabius, who will be uh, hosting next year's climate negotiation. The purpose of our report is very straightforward, though very difficult. It says that the world is on an extremely dangerous trajectory now, where human-induced climate change has already raised the world's mean temperature by about one degree Celsius. And given the rate of greenhouse gas emissions, we are likely to reach four to six degrees Celsius by the end of this century. Yet our governments, Japan, the United States, China, the other signatories of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, have recognized already back in 2009 that we must avoid a rise of temperature above two degrees Celsius. Because if we were to pass that threshold, the dangers for the planet would be absolutely too great. Not only would uh, we face more extreme weather, heat waves, droughts, floods, typhoons, and rising sea levels, but we would also enter a climate zone in which natural feedback processes could tremendously amplify the human-induced change and cause a runaway climate change. That's why the two degrees centigrade has sometimes been called a guardrail, in other words, a safety rail for the world. I find it shocking, and I can't emphasize enough, that we are nowhere close to achieving the two degrees centigrade goal. We are going to surpass this limit very soon, and it will become absolutely unachievable unless we take decisive action and agree on a new trajectory of global development at next year's climate summit. The data are quite stark, and let me uh, just mention what they are. On average, the world is emitting about five tons of carbon dioxide per person, with total emissions of about 36 billion tons of CO2. In order for us to keep to the two degrees Celsius limit, we have to cut those emissions sharply by the middle of the century, perhaps to 12 or 13 billion tons of CO2 per capita, with a population which will be significantly larger than the current population. We have to cut total emissions by roughly two thirds even as the world population will expand by around 40%. Per capita emissions, therefore, will have to decline from about five tons per capita world average to something around 1.2 to 1.5 tons per capita by the middle of the century. For the high income countries like the United States or like Japan, the amount of change that will be needed is absolutely extraordinary. 
according to the most recent uh, data, uh, Japan's uh, emissions uh, per capita uh, were, uh, in 2012 about nine tons per person. And in the United States uh, emissions uh, were on the order of about 16 tons per person. Uh, in fact, 17 tons per person in the data of the International Energy Agency. We're going to have to decarbonize our energy systems dramatically if there is hope to stay within the two degree centigrade limit. And that hope is only this The consequences could be very, very grave. A matter of complete irresponsibility of our generation if we make the effort. So the study that I showed you uh, on the screen just a moment ago is a study of a project that I direct for UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon called the Sustainable Development Solutions Network or SDSN. And the SDSN uh, has sponsored one project called the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project which brought together energy experts from 15 countries, including all of the major emitting countries, China, Japan, Korea, the United States, Canada, Australia, Indonesia, and others, to ask the modeling teams to examine how each respective economy can be decarbonized by the middle of the 21st century. In order to accomplish this would require fundamental changes in our energy systems. Basically, three big changes would be needed. Electricity would have to become essentially zero carbon emitting through the use of wind, solar power, nuclear power, carbon capture and sequestration, geothermal energy, and other potential zero carbon sources, including hydroelectric power. We would need to have almost our entire fleet of vehicles be electric vehicles. We would need our housing stock and our buildings to be heated, not by furnaces and boilers, but by heat pumps and electricity. And of course, we would need tremendous efficiency of energy use, reducing tremendously the amount of energy needed per uh, service uh, provided in the economy. So this is the three pillar strategy for deep decarbonization. There are no countries in the high income world that are truly on track to reduce the carbon emissions down to the necessary level. For Japan, this would mean cutting the per capita emissions uh, roughly uh, by a factor four. For the United States, roughly by a factor 10. The evidence of our study is that this can be accomplished through very deep transformation along the three pillars that I suggested just now of low carbon electricity, electrification of vehicles and buildings, and very strong movement towards energy efficiency. Yet, are we really on a path to negotiate such an agreement in Paris at COP21? The answer is, so far, absolutely no, because politics is driving our governments towards a very limited agreement, not a deep agreement. And therefore, one of the major areas that I would like to stress is that every country in Asia, every country represented at your conference, which is a forum on sustainable development in Asia needs to examine the energy system to create pathways, scenarios for very deep decarbonization. This is a very difficult task, but it's needed in China, the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases. It's needed in Japan, one of the world's major emitters of greenhouse gases. It's needed in Korea, now one of the world's largest economies. It's needed in Indonesia uh, and in other parts of Asia. Of course, not just Asia, the European Union, the United States, Australia, Canada, all need to put forward meaningful, strong, 
pathways of deep decarbonization consistent with the global limit already agreed of staying below two degrees Celsius of mean temperature increase. Let me conclude by noting that in this context, not only does our report show that such pathways are feasible, our report emphasizes the kind of agreement that we will need in Paris in 2015. First, we need an agreement which honors the two degrees Celsius limit. Second, we need an agreement that is based on the best science of the allowable carbon budget that would keep us within the two degrees Celsius limit. Third, we need every country to agree not just on short-term measures, but on providing a path for the nation for deep decarbonization by the middle of the century and agreeing to publish that path for inspection, interrogation, comparison by other countries as well. For example, the United States has never published an energy plan to 2050. It's never made a commitment of deep decarbonization in any detail. It needs to do so now. Same with China, same with Japan, Canada, Australia, and the other major emitting countries. And the third part of the agreement, in addition to short-run goals, in addition to each country publishing a long-term deep decarbonization pathway, would be a worldwide shared effort to accelerate progress on low carbon energy systems and high efficiency. The world got together to support scientists to discover the Higgs boson. The world has gotten together on many occasions to study new initiatives in semiconductors or in the internet. Governments have undertaken strong technology leadership programs in the United States in biotechnology, in human genome mapping, even in the race to the moon, of course. We need to do the same now as part of this agreement with a strong global commitment to a major research and development program on nuclear safety, on carbon capture and sequestration technologies, on storage of intermittent wind and solar power, of improvements of building design, of low cost, high uh, reliability uh, electric vehicles, and so on and so forth. We need to say it's serious. The world has committed to a two degree Celsius limit. The science tells us that that requires deep decarbonization and that requires new technologies and improvements of existing technologies so that we can move in that direction. We have a lot of work to do within the next 18 months. But I believe that if we can find our way to a successful set of sustainable development goals, a financial package, and then in December 2015, a strong climate agreement based on two degrees Celsius, we will have contributed to making the world a safer, fairer, and more prosperous place. Asia, as home to more than half of the world's population, has a tremendous responsibility of leadership, especially given Japan's technological excellence, given uh, China's dynamism, uh, given the dynamism of Korea and other countries in the region. It's time for Asia to help lead the transition to a low carbon global energy system. It's good for the economy, it's vital for human survival. Let me thank ISAP for this meeting, for the chance to join you. Uh, and I hope that uh, these remarks uh, are useful for your deliberations. And I do welcome you to look at the website of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network to download the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project. And I hope to embrace the main recommendations and to help urge governments within Asia to take this seriously and be prepared 
to develop and then implement pathways of deep decarbonization. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sachs. Sachs-sama, arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you very so much, Professor Sachs. We would like to move on the plenary session. I'd like to invite speakers to proceed to the stage.